Oh, hello there. Hello, and welcome to episode four of Working Title. I'm Ryan Fring with the BitLife Show. What the hell is that? <laughs> this week we're talking with us. It's another one of our PK episodes where we're talking to the visual team behind the Princess Night. And that just so happens to be us. I am the cinematographer or director of photography for the show or for the movie. And John is the director of special effects. So today we're gonna to talk about things like why you should never make a puppet movie. Um, why you should never make a puppet movie and the challenges of filmmaking on an indie budget. And by indie budget, I mean no budget. So let's do it. Today we're gonna to talk to the camera department, which is backflip, John and myself. Um, and now Julia, uh, yes. but she, she does more producing mm-hmm. when we're on PK. Yeah. Um, but we were, we were asked a little while ago to come on as, uh, as the DP and, and camera and special effects as well uh, for the Princess Night. And we said yes. And uh, the rest is history. So great job, guys. That was a great episode. Hooray. See you guys. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Nicely on. done, John. I loved what you had to say there. I was thinking maybe for those who are at home who can probably hear the excess facial hair. <laughs> Um, should we talk about uh, why we look like <laughs> you this should right describe now? The, yeah the excess mm-hmm. facial hair I mean Not, obviously excess is v- uh, we should point out excess <laughs> there's for no like suggestion about amount yeah, yeah for like it's, little children yes. like excess <laughs> like yeah. if I was a child <laughs> yeah. yeah the three of us well obviously because Jeff does well it's I do well because Christmas is right around the corner um, that we're all growing our Christmas beards so I guess that's all there is to say about that. Christmas beards be come, but once a like year. Santa Claus. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh. I realize I'm the only one at this table who doesn't have any facial hair, and I'm happy about that. Oh, I'm very <laughs> that happy about fact. that as well. <laughs> Julia, did you not get the memo? I'm trying. This is as good as I can do. We still send out paper memos when it comes to our beards. <laughs> I got the memo, but I can't so, be part so of this very special club. <laughs> I'm glad you're not. Uh, the woman at McDonald's had <laughs> facial hair a little bit more than me in one uh, spot. Oh. And th- I just couldn't help but stare at it. There's a point where that gets awkward. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, ah. so, Hopefully she it doesn't uh, listen to this podcast. Ladies at home. <laughs> uh, Keep well, those chins shaved. Shave shame. that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can we say that? Is that? I don't, I don't know. I'm the editor. I know ex- there are excellent waxers in Madison <laughs> who can take care of that. Excellent. All right. So those names will be going across the bottom of the screen right now. Yes. <laughs> right there. Okay. So, but but <laughs> <laughs> Phil Hatu. <laughs> to be honest, like, though, wait, he's not a waxer. Why hold on a there? second. Should we actually say who Phil is? Oh yeah, Phil's joining us. Let's let's introduce everybody. <laughs> we Phil should Hattu, probably do that. Designer and uh, fashionista extraordinaire. <laughs> Does that mean you draw on uh, regular uh, fashionista? <laughs> I think he's a fashionista. Oh, actually, you put Fa- the, yeah, you put that's the right. O it's Spanish. Fa- yeah. Fashionistino. That's Magneto. You know for. Because I'm small. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's cute. It means Good. like adorable. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Is a girl adorable? Is that? I'm adorable. Adorable. <laughs> That's it. Adorable. I, getting, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't sound Spanish. How do you pronounce that? Well, adorable. Watch for adorable. Her. Watch for her. Is that is that good for Phil? Is that, <laughs> that, 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 is, that was her? great. Is I that? think that's perfect. Mucho okay. adorable. Oh, Watch yeah. for our future episode of this podcast where we go over words that are not actually foreign <laughs> words. <laughs> that will be an exciting episode. <laughs> words. Bonjourno. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go to the classic. So. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so at least you're fun little story about how we how we became since since nobody asked that question, I'll answer it. Um, how we got brought on? I was I was jerking ar- jerking around. <laughs> <laughs> I was dicking around. Okay, that's that's what I usually say. I, suddenly, I was just I suddenly do not like sitting. Next I was to you. wasting time. <laughs> there we go. Okay, you know, like okay. reading my news feeds and looking at Kickstarter. When all of a sudden somebody that I went to high school with and worked with in high school and college uh, popped up on Kickstarter and. It was TC, and then he was surrounded by puppets. And I was like, what the heck's going on? And it said Madison, Wisconsin on it, uh, which is where we are. And I got interested in it, and I watched it, and it looked like a little promo for a film. And I was like, hey, I'd love to talk to you guys and um, love to you know, maybe work on some stuff together since you're in town. We have a company. It would be awesome. Um, so sent an email, got an email back from a guy named Chris, uh, who we'll talk to later, one of the producers. And he said, hey, let's, let's sit – you know, let's sit down and talk about stuff. And he was, he had no idea. He's like, well, who's this guy who wants to do something and et cetera, et cetera. And then he 
he comes walking into our studio and uh, I think he can he can tell you his experience later but uh, I think was a little bit stunned he was not expecting what he walked into and then we were later there talking. There was paper everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Trash. And, Dead uh, body. Blood. Blood. <laughs> Lots of blood. Um, when we were talking later about films that we've worked on and things like that, we mentioned one of the 48-hour films that we had done, the Missing Cat one, which uh, three or four years previous was the film that he loved and showed his team for the successive 48-hour film contests as cool. here's the bar that we have to hit. Um, so then I think... Uh, you know, he was kind of excited. He's like, oh, that was you guys? And, you know, the rest was history. Thanks, guys. We uh, were, uh, that's right. it. All right. <laughs> we, were that, we were that bar. It's never, <laughs> we've never gone above that bar. <laughs> Still there. Every, every, every project has a, uh, has a missing cat moment in it now as a <laughs> reference to everything you guys have done. I'm not trying to be like, oh, I was a part of that, because I wasn't a part of that. It was by association. Yes, by association. You are. Yeah. Osmosis. Hmm. Yeah. It was. I think it was nice to, you know, like, you know, we're excited about this project, but then to have Chris excited about us, which, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think we were kind of like, wow, you know, I, I, it was a perfect um, bringing together of those two companies, mm-hmm. Firmament Films and Backflip Films. You know, we we're both excited about working with the other, mm-hmm. which was a nice surprise because we kind of felt like, well, this would be fun to get in on this thing that looks really cool, mm-hmm. and hopefully we can do it. But then Chris was like, you know, really excited to work with us. So we're awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. What was, what was your first thought? When I don't I told know you how about to finish it. a thought. <laughs> <laughs> when I told you about it, like, hey, there's this puppet movie that my friends are making. Do you want to help out? What were you thinking? I thought, let's see. Um, I have little children at home. We're running our own business. Um, I have other things I do on the side. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> do a feature length movie with puppets. I got about three <laughs> hours between one a.m. and four p.m. that I'm not doing anything. It's just sleep. We can do yeah. it then, right? I wanted to fill the rest of that time. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think like running our our production company, we've always wanted to make a, a film. And honestly, like this is that first real opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like we're making a film and when it's done, we're gonna have this feature length movie that's really cool that had a lot of work going into it. (laughs) Um, They already, I mean, TC had a great script and Chris did a lot of work pulling pulling people together and producing. So, and then as well as everyone else, I mean, obviously you're both involved in it, you're doing a ton. So it's, it's kind of, it wasn't ready made. That's the term that's coming to my mind, Mm -hmm. but it was kind of like, there's already this opportunity to work on this really cool project and we don't have to come up with something, Mm -hmm. you know, just jump in and start working together. Yeah. And then it's going to be, I guess I shouldn't put the, the, uh, cart Cart before before the the horse. horse. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you want the, you want that horse in front uh, (laughs) or on top of the cart. I don't, where were you going with that? Um, put the horse in the cart. He has an easier time. He prefers that. Um, Anyway, so I shouldn't I shouldn't put the cart before the horse. The movie's not done yet, but when it's all said and done, uh, we're gonna have something that's really awesome, mm-hmm. you know, and that's gonna propel us to the next project. I which think too, oh, which uh, will which will be the sequel. <laughs> the sequel, the right? Sequel. Part two. Yeah, we, we already know what this sequel is gonna be. Yeah, all the troll. <laughs> <laughs> troll block two. Troll block two. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, by the way, you can see at um, youtubecom slash user slash trollblave. Do okay. Hold on a second. What? Yes. What did you just say? <laughs> what? YouTube.com <laughs> slash user slash trollblave. What is that? Um, it's sorry, I've got YouTube is a site where you can watch videos. Uh, <laughs> be, you can upload them like Google from your bottom. phone. Yeah. It's he from said Google. blave. With is that what you're worried about? Is that it's part. blave? Yeah. B-L-A-V-E. What was that? Um, it's a it's a joke we're working to. I'm not. E- I'm not even joking. I'm not even joking. Troll blave, blave is like B-L-A-V-E. blog. B l a v e. Like, yes. like for the, those of the, you listening. The so there's gonna at, at some point there's going to be the big epic reveal of what of the why for two years you said blave <laughs> instead of blog. Yep. And the is t- there any chance that the joke like lives up to the hype? Like no. for, to like a two year a hyped thing. We're going to make a movie, and in that movie, which coincidentally is also the sequel to Princess Knight, we reveal what the blave is. 
We're That's hoping, a complete and utter lie. We're, we're hoping that the, the uh, that four out of the ten people that watch it will love the joke. <laughs> They'll be like, totally worth it. It's and so confusing, like, too, because it's never in the show. No. Right? It's no. all it's the troll blog. Troll blog. Welcome to the troll blog. Yeah, he sings the song as yeah. troll blog. Yep. The opening credit says the troll blog. But he will read. No, he URL does refer Blave. to it as Blave every once in a while in credit. In the beginning, he generally says, welcome to my troll Blave. I am the troll. That's it. <laughs> you sound a lot like him. I That's know. Nice. Isn't that yeah. weird? Yeah. It's yeah, my, good at that I impression. barely need to go in and out of any voice. Yeah. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> jumped in. What's yeah. been interesting, I think, is that Backflip Films and Firmament Films have already made some successful shorts that should be mentioned. Oh, yeah. In that we've won several 48-hour film festivals right. in Madison collaborating. Sorry, what were those? <laughs> 48-hour film festivals. We just break into songs. Julia's starting to talk like me now. 48-hour <laughs> festivals. Why don't you Welcome take to. the spotlight for a moment <laughs> and help us get out of away from this? I like how we started. Can I just, my observation so far is we started talking about Princess Knight for about 10 seconds. And we started talking about <laughs> troll blog. <laughs> That's my goal as part of the show. <laughs> So yeah, talk as much as you can because in the last episode you talked twice. Twice, I think I thought I talked three times. Uh, you might have been three. I'm totally listening. But you right. you did you did appear to just kind of be there in the middle. I was watching a tennis match. Yeah, you really were <laughs> just this watching people whipping going back my and head forth, back so. and forth. My neck was sore the next day from as all the tennis match. Run. As the editor, I would like to say, please talk. I can. <laughs> so, so so tell us about. Let the... me continue okay. to interrupt you Shut so you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, go ahead. Go. go so go. I first met John and Ryan on the 2013 Madison 48 Hour Film Festival where we we wrote The Noise. And The Noise won a whole bunch of awards. But what was interesting is I actually never met you guys, I think, until the night the movie was like released in Madison because you were here making the credits. And then at the end, I was like, who are those guys? Oh, those days from Backflip. I'm like, oh. Then we won a whole bunch of awards. $5. Yeah, exactly. And then, then game day. And then special effects for Suck at St. Louis or St. Louis Sucks or whatever that one was called. Vampires, that's right. Vampires in Milwaukee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then recently, we, Firmament and Backflip, worked on the Four Points Film Challenge in October, and there were over 100 films submitted, and we are in the top 20. That's awesome. Yay. So yeah. we're so, filming now. We're, they, we're, yes. the, uh, we're the camera and special effects department. We did all these special effects for and the credits for The Noise and a couple of these other films. Um, and finally earned the pleasure of um, being the director of photography and director of special effects and basically all things visual. So we were brought on to do that. Um, and it's been kind of crazy because we, we do this professionally and it's a lot different when you're working on something that's three minutes and something that's two hours and ten minutes or however long the film finally is when it gets cut. And, you know, one thing that we actually learned um, – that would have been great knowing in. I, well, there's probably like a hundred of those things. Um, yes. The first don't is don't do a movie with puppets. Don't do yeah. a movie with puppets. <laughs> TC uh, said that last time. I'm pretty sure <laughs> they decided. Firmament and decided. You know why not do the hardest thing we possibly can um, and do a film <laughs> with puppets. And so, uh, so don't film with puppets ever. Um, we actually, you might be able to see a little bit into this space. We film right up here with our first set, our first oh, castle yeah. set. Mm -hmm. So you can see it. It actually did turn out pretty well. Um, it looks like a castle and looks real and looks great. Um, but it, we, the first weekend we shot, we threw it all away uh, because it's hard to shoot with puppets when you have no, no space for them. Um, we will maybe throw some pictures up too. We literally had them laying on the ground, being as flat as they could, getting their arm up as high as they could because the sets started pretty low. They, they actually started on the floor yeah. the first weekend um, and went about 10 feet or 9 feet off the ground. Now, I am not a small person. <laughs> As I'm sure that camera can tell, and that camera can tell, and this one can even tell as well. I'm really I sorry about talking about your weight before, Jeff. Because I I'm heavy. I am I didn't very <laughs> sensitive I didn't about mean. this, and anybody who brings it up is a jerk. <laughs> so, <Okay>. sorry. <laughs> if I had a beer, I'd break it. Did you like <laughs> but one? But only after I finish drinking it, because I don't waste alcohol. Anyways, <laughs> thin, small sets, not a thin guy. Not the easiest thing in the world to do. We I'm can still see your that. shirt. Yeah, I, and that wasn't just you. It was like every puppeteer. Every, yeah, it was and Aaron. I'm probably yeah. the puppeteer's <laughs> least favorite person on set because I'm always yelling at them. Um, yeah. Yep, see your arm. Get it higher. Get it higher. Get it because they're they're laying down. They're stretching up as high as they can. And then I ask them to get higher. 
you know, so they can but get, get your head out of the way and yes. then get your head out of the way. So all these things, which are so, more or less physically impossible, which they're, you know, we're demanding of them to do. So basically I need to disconnect my arm at the elbow yeah. and make it float <laughs> That's your shoulder. Feet that way. Mm-hmm. Elbow, shoulder, same thing. I mean, we, we joke, we joke too, yeah. that if they're not uncomfortable, you know, or hurting, they're not doing they're it. They're not right doing now. it right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, very and true. Jeff's one of our main puppeteers. And then we have Jessica, who's also Jessica Mayer. Um, the producer's wife, who's also another puppeteer, and they're they're are probably number one troopers because they'll stand around for eight hours a day and do this when we're when we're filming, um, and Up we ask crazy things for them to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. because you can't you can't do normal things that you do with people. I can I can carry a camera around on my shoulder to shoot a person. I can follow a person by walking with a camera on my shoulder. You can't do that with puppets. You know, I either have to get up higher because the puppeteers are standing up and their arms are higher than them, so the puppets are actually seven feet in the air, and I have to get seven feet up in the air in the move, or we all get lower and we put them on dollies, and not only do we have you know three or four puppeteer or puppeteers on dollies holding puppets, we also have to have two or three or four, depending on how many people move, mm-hmm. other people pushing and pulling them while trying to hide in about... I don't know, 10 inches, 10 mm-hmm. inches, mm-hmm. you know, so that um, they can't be seen by the camera. <laughs> you know, and the other the other thing that's happening, though, is so Going a lot of these it. shots are resulting in more and more and more visual effects work because <laughs> yeah. it's like, well, that one was really, really good and the acting was right on and the camera was good. But then we saw a little bit of a person in that one shot. Is that okay? Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I guess. It's going to be two years of filming and, and six years of post. Yes. <laughs> Just to it's like, oh, else. did you guys, you know, if they don't hear what the movie's about, we be like, yeah, we had six years in post-production. Oh, were you doing like a, you know, a, a blockbuster, you know, like Lord like of the Rings. With lots with cat of, people? No. No, we just had to paint out a lot of people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think something no. else that it's like it's been a learning curve for us. What I remember as assistant directors when we first started is like taking hundreds of shots at different angles. And I remember a meeting we had where John's like, you guys have way too much footage. You have to cut back on the footage. Well, I don't know that if was I Chris. said that. That, that was, was not Chris. me. No, it's yeah. not you? Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, so no. How, how we, John Are and I want to sure? shoot. Uh, it was Chris. <laughs> how John and I want to shoot is give give the editor every option because most of them won't work okay. and when they do work we want to have at least one other option <laughs> <laughs> because you know with with the puppets being so difficult um, but we did we did get smarter no with you it. got you did we, we planned it out a lot better so instead of instead of nine or 12 yes. shots for each scene we simplified it down to three to six yes. uh, different angles and, you know, punch ins. Yeah. The, the, oh, go ahead. the main thing is, you know, like for all you uh, following along at home, um, it, we're doing it film film style, you know, like just like you learn in film school, you're you're going through, you're getting your establishing shot, you're doing a shot, B shot, you know, wide shot for conversational things. You've got your wides, mediums, close ups. Um, But what we tried to do to make it more efficient was to say, usually the the climax of the conversation is going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's where we're going to just we're going to be up close. We Mm -hmm. know that Um, to bring the puppets to life. We need to be closer because if you're just wide the whole time and just watching the puppets move around, Mm -hmm. you're not really getting in there. Um, seeing them move, you know, bringing the characters to life. So it, it looks almost more like a stage show when <coughs> right. it's just why the entire time. Right. And and so that's I think that was where we were going with our mm-hmm. trying to get more efficient is just you know cut out a few of those pieces where we're like right. okay right, what's the percentage chance we're going to use the wide yeah. on this on these lines you know no I know I want to be up close mm-hmm. um, but yeah that came with storyboarding as well mm-hmm. like TC being able to direct us a little bit more yeah. and say right. Regardless of what we shoot, I know what I'm going to want when we get right. to post. Yeah, and we we actually that's another good point. We started off without without storyboards, um, and with a lot of expectation that camera camera guy uh, DP would come up with. That's me who's talking. Ryan would come up with what shots we're going to do and what everything's going to look like, and that is a ton of responsibility and ton of work, which is not the DP's prerogative. You know, the DP's prerogative is about execution, and you know doing it well and coming up with contextually for the shot 
are we wide? Are we close? Is it a canted angle? You know, what the heck is it going to be? That's more the director's prerogative. So, you know, being first time feature length uh, filmmakers, it was something that we had to talk about um, as a team and kind of re divvy up the the, the duties um, when we're pre producing heading into a shoot so that we had the storyboards so that then I could look at the storyboards and say, got it. I know how to do that shot. Here's what we're going to yeah. do. Looking at that, okay, we have, you know, four four different setups and we started working with the assistant director, mm-hmm. Julia, to narrow that down. So then now Julia has a much better sense of um, the different shots and can st- and, uh, write, write out all the setups that we have mm-hmm. to do. Um, and then really my responsibility goes even, you know, even more narrowly um, to just working on the image, which has been fantastic. Um, you know, not having to design pathways for puppeteers. I don't know if you guys remember much of that, um, but you know, early on, everybody was talking about, well, how do we mm-hmm. achieve this move where these puppets go that way and this one goes that way and mm-hmm. then one comes mm-hmm. in? Everybody was a part of that discussion. Yeah. Now we're smart making movies, uh, you know, maybe like like real people do, where there's <laughs> somebody day. in charge. Yes. There's somebody <laughs> in charge, and everyone can shut the heck up. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, who's not responsible for that? And so. Um, that's been that's been really great. I feel like it's important to point out, uh, well, like with a normal film, I feel like like a lot of these setups you could set up, you could have you'd have a couple of different angles for a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of general stuff running at the same time, so you could grab like that wide right. and that medium, especially TV. Right, that's a little harder for when right. it comes to this because it's harder to set up a shot where you have multiple cameras where you are guaranteeingly not seeing the puppeteer. Right. You could potentially, I guess, throw the two cameras next to each other and one gets a close and one gets the medium, but mm-hmm. like, it's not as easy to do with puppets. It would be easier to do with a live action film because mm-hmm. there's really generally not somebody standing directly below your main actor holding him up. But no, like I feel so. I feel like that goes into a lot of that planning that you were talking about. Like it's good that there's a lot of planning that needs to be done for a production like this. And I mean, that's that's a really important point that we knew early on, but didn't know what it looked like. Mm -hmm. You know, we knew that we needed a plan, but we didn't know what we needed to plan Mm -hmm. because we didn't know how we were going to shoot, how we were going to puppeteer, and et cetera, et cetera. And Jeff, you were kind of made lead puppeteer, so you're kind of lead troubleshooter of you know we want the puppet to do this, figure it out. Yeah, and just being like, well. Okay, and yeah. nine times out of ten, it's like okay. Yeah, we'll see how that works. Does it and hurt? Just go, no, no. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or again, like I said before, I just my arm goes numb after a while, and I don't even realize it's still up in the air. And it's like okay, we're just gonna keep recording, and I'm here. Yeah, everybody went to lunch. Still here, <laughs> <laughs> chilling with my arm up in the air. Yeah. So another another interesting thing with puppets and and with um you know indie filmmaking. Do you need to leave, Julia? I have three more minutes. Okay. Um, is lighting, and that's something John can talk to as um, gaffer, second gaffer. We have two gaffers. John's usually there more than our, <laughs> our other gaffer. Yeah. But, um, well, I, I just wanted to say real quick that it's it's challenging because felt reflects light differently, and we don't, didn't have a ton of lights. We had a little light kit, and we've gotten some assistance from uh, MKE in Milwaukee, Milwaukee Rental, what do they call MKE it? MKE Rental Production? Yeah. Um, so we, we've Should been able to use a bunch a of horrible their plug. more. <laughs> That's not MKE the name of it. Rental Check Productions. Check out the website right here. Uh, oh, great! Now I have to find it. <laughs> and it's, blink, it's blinking, probably. Um, but we've, you know, we've we've increased the lighting equipment that we have, and, and outside is a separate challenge. Um, but you know, it's it's definitely again completely different than shooting with with people or, or interviews, and um, for instance, setting up a whole castle scene where people are going to be moving in and out. Yeah, so that's a question. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, in, in the camera department, I'm mm-hmm. I'm effectively serving the role of um, AC as well as gaffer sometimes. Um, you know, the thing about felt reflecting differently than skin is that it doesn't reflect, and so that's right. It takes a lot more light to <laughs> get you know difference. to get a one side of the face you know lit up, and mm-hmm. then the other side you know get your shadow on the other side. It takes a lot of light. Um, and we have limited lights, mm-hmm. uh, you know, working as an indie film, you know, when you've had another gaffer in here, Jordan Post, when he's in here lighting, um, the challenge is like, okay, well, here's what we need to do with lighting. And if you're a gaffer, you're probably thinking, okay, I know what I would do. And it's like, but here's the very small limited <laughs> set, set of, of tools, tools yeah. you have to work with. That's right. Go. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like this whole know. movie is like an evil challenge for <laughs> mm-hmm. filmmakers. Yes. It is, <laughs> but it's a fun evil challenge. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a fun evil. It's it's the yeah. fun evil. It's the fun one. Um, yeah. So I mean that that's the difficulty is felt doesn't reflect light. It's it's going <laughs> to absorb it. So I mean you need a lot of light you know, in order to do what you want to do with cameras, um, in order to get the depth of field that you want on certain shots. Uh, or to shoot with the lens that you want or just shoot at the shutter speed, um, whatever that you want, like you need to have lights to mm-hmm. have flexibility. And when you're just lighting just so that you have just enough to see, um, you don't have a lot, you know, okay, well now let's make that, you know, mm-hmm. brighter on that side and get contrast here and add a little bit here. And then this is what I want for depth of field. There's a, there's a lot to think about in some ways the puppets make it a little easier because you don't have to play around with as much uh, soft light um, because they're not going to get like hard um, shiny spots on their faces and things like that. So they're less greasy. (laughs) They're less greasy. Extra makeup. The oils on the inside. (laughs) Oil and sweat. (laughs) Yes. Yes. They're greasy on the inside. (laughs) Yes. Can uh, we zoom in on Phil's face on that one? (laughs) Welcome to <laughs> Creepy Talk. <laughs> Particularly Julia, the troll. I have to go. Julia is going to go. I so. have to teach yoga. And it's also MKE Production Rental uh, in yeah. Milwaukee. Check them out. So yeah. now that Julia is, awesome. she's going to go teach yoga, which means she's just going to disappear. Like, I'm going to snap my fingers and she's going to go away. Bink. Yeah, snap your finger. What? Oh, wait, where'd she, she go? go? Wait, is she gone now? Wait, no, she's not gone yet. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, ready? wait, we all have to freeze. Okay, That's the character. Uh, there it is. Right there. Whoa, Whoa where'd she go? Hey, hey, I was like, Matt, is there a way that we can uh, hear us <laughs> in the freeze frame? <laughs> maybe maybe you just actually freeze frame. <laughs> you probably and then hear the <laughs> we'll probably have to. As, as our business has grown over the year, it's been a year since we started working on this film. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also upgraded all of our camera equipment. We started with the Canon uh, 5D Mark III, but instead of using compressed MP4, we uh, which records in the card on the camera, we got the um, uncompressed HDMI out to a separate recorder that we used, um, the Blackmagic uh, Hyperdeck Shuttle. Um, and what that allowed us to do is basically use the uncompressed 8-bit um, image that was captured by the sensor, even though it recorded in 10 bit, it was still 8 bit, but it's uncompressed because in the in the Mark III camera, um, you know, basically the the more expensive the technology, the better the compression or the le- less amount of compression that you need. So in one of these DSLRs that started off as a photography camera, um, there was a lot of compression. So H.264, which is a very highly compressed format, um, but can look really great. So. That was interesting how I finished that. Uh, just, uh, you know, my tone. It was, uh, it was the end of a thought, but it was like, really great, really, really great. <laughs> and that's all. And that's all. Um, so we, start, we started off with that, and you see that in the castle scene. We did, um, I think, pretty much the entirety of the Baron's castle mm-hmm. with the Mark III. So that's going to have its own own look, and you know, so it's a little bit more grainy because it's very dark, and um, we're going to play that up as aesthetic. Uh, like we intended it, it to be all like that. All <clears throat> intended to be that. It looks. Way. I mean, it looks good. Um, but then we eventually bought new cameras. Um, go, again, going with Black Magic, we we bought the Black Magic uh, Production 4K camera, um, which gives us if we wanted 4K RAW. But for this, we don't. We're just we're still shooting um, 1080p. Yeah, it's I, a, I it's waved a camera at right that there. camera. That's right. That's the camera. It waved back. It did. It was awkward. It was weird. I don't know um, whose hand that was. Listeners at home. Uh, so now we have Some we have the production 4K. Uh, we don't shoot in 4K. We don't shoot in RAW. Uh, but we do shoot in in uh, 1080p ProRes HQ. Uh, it's there. So ProRes is a, an Apple codec. Um, and the HQ uh, setting is basically a high-quality version of that codec. Um, they have kind of preset up defaults. They have LT, which is... I don't know, light. I say that in my head. I don't know if there's a... I, I, that's how I, I always say it. I don't know. Low <laughs> texture. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> LT, HQ, regular, and then 4444, which you can also do. Um, but the ProRes 422 HQ is what we film in. And there's 12 and a half stops um, of... Uh, we'll probably All restart the that. <laughs> All the things. <laughs> <And> there's... <laughs> 
<laughs> what is it called? The aperture? Uh, no, it's the the range of the sensor. Um, dynamic range. The dynamic range of the sensor oh. is 12. I think it's 12 for normal um, ProRes recording and then maybe 13 for the, for the raw recording. So that kind of dynamic range is what you'll find in your nicer cameras like your RED um, or your Ari Alexa or, you know, the more expensive camera. So it's really nice. It's a huge upgrade to what we were shooting before, um, but it still maintains that cinematic feel and it's great because we like i said earlier we did finish that whole scene with that one camera so now the rest of the movie we're going to have this better camera for um which i think is gonna is gonna look great so does somebody have questions because i feel kind of douchey like let me tell you more about camera stuff well i feel like that's some, are you asking me if i have questions <laughs> yeah i mean you're a good interviewer <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Not in this by context. The, by the you, way, you Phil, were when we were at BW 3s You know, drinking. Sorry. And he's gonna get you. By yeah. the way, Phil, you are now the interviewer. Go. Yeah, I'm. I am interested to hear more about storyboarding. To be honest, I thought that that was kind of an interesting thing, and and the the transition from not having storyboards to having them. And I saw some of the the storyboards. Uh, TC did those, right? Yeah, right. They were awesome. He's a cartoonist. And I just I, they like were from awesome. a from a DP standpoint or whatever, like having those and what, what kind of effect that has. And is it difficult to, um, you know, get your own vision in there or is it, are you just kind of, are you handcuffed by them or are you, is the experience augmented by them? Yeah. So there's, there's two aspects to every, um, every role in, in film production. There's an artistic side and a technical side. And I feel like there's more and less for different, different roles, but, uh, specifically with uh, director of photography, there's a lot of technical things that you're you're thinking about and um, you know have to keep in mind in order to execute the artistic um, uh, thing that you're trying to achieve to, to execute the artistic vision, right? Um, when you don't know what the artistic vision is, it's really hard to do those other things. So starting with storyboards has been fantastic, um, where I can then start where the DP needs to start not thinking necessarily about how do we best tell this story element because we've already had those conversations and then the storyboards were created from that because I'll, you know, uh, TC and I will powwow about things. How do we think we should do this? You know, um, it's great. It's a very, um, kind of open dialogue between us where he has an idea he wants to communicate and, you know, working with cameras professionally gives me a little bit of an edge on here's how I think we could tell that in a good way. Um, and then between that and his love of movies and experience with movies, um, we can determine, you know, some extra shots that we're going to do, but he is in charge of that and will write it all down regardless of whether it's any input from me or just all his ideas. And so when we get that, then we can, like I was saying with Julia, with the assistant director, we can take that and pare it all down to here's our three setups. <clears throat> And I can focus on how to best make those setups work instead of thinking about where do puppets go, what do puppets have to do, where does scenery have to be, and all that. I can take it and say, okay, I need to have a medium shot where the person does this. They turn right, they talk to somebody over there, and they whip left, and I whip with them or whatever it is. Then I can think about the image and say, all right, if we're outside, it's been really nice because we just, we just go wherever the heck we want. Um, and I can pick up a scene and say, all right, let's do it right here. The puppeteer can get up and this, this is a great image. Um, let's get, you know, let's get a flag right here. Let's soften this up. Let's bounce it over there. You know, that's when I start then working with John and kind of discussing, uh, or the other gaffer, Jordan, uh, and start kind of discussing what we want. What's the mood, you know, is it pre-fall, post-fall, you know, those types of things. Like, are we, are we in the heroic, you know, the triumphant moment or are we in the uh, descending in the darkness moment? Because those look, look very differently. And so, you know, being able to start where I need to start then frees me to really work on the technical and artistic aspects that a d uh, director of photography or a camera person is supposed to be working on. Well, and I think the other thing is on, on a set, because you're working in this creative way, things are going to come up that you didn't anticipate or a shot or you're going to add a shot or take away something or do it in a little different way. That's going to happen no matter what. So starting from a storyboard is helpful because if you come in just blind, then you're creating everything. And then you have all kinds of problems with like, um, you know, then you have editing problems cause you've got continuity issues that haven't been thought about because again, the DP, like mm -hmm. that's just, that's too much to like keep in your head all at once when you're trying to compose the shot. So then you're trying to think about how that fits to get, you know, whatever. And, and something you kind of made me think of there was, you know, you can't shoot a movie without a script. Well, I mean, you could, oh, I you remember could shoot. 
<laughs> all right, and then I'll go into mine. Go ahead. Okay, so this is uh, all staying in. By the way, I'm, no, 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 all, all staying in. All the, this, the any I anybody listening it. to podcasts are just like fast forwarding. Well, like, in all fairness, they made it. Put chapters they in. made it about a half hour into it, and then we actually got a legitimate, serious <laughs> ten minute gap there about storyboarding. Ten and minute gap. <laughs> <laughs> there was a ten minute was section of wasted time no, where between, they talked about something fun. relevant. No one listens to the boring stuff. No, it's a lie. Here it is. I got it. Okay. So I was going to compare it to the writer. Like when the writer writes a script, and I I think there's a f- few and far between where you see a writer, producer, director, actor mm-hmm. that actually turns out good. You know, because. Part of what makes films great is that there's different people focusing on one specific aspect. And so the writer writes something and has something in their mind, and then the director looks at that, and they interpret something from that, and they come up with this vision that they kind of sketch out with a storyboard artist that is hopefully pretty close to what they had, and then the DP takes that and brings it to life in camera. Well, at some point, the director needs to, you know decide that that's close enough to their vision because it's not going to be what is in your mind Mm -hmm. before you're on set i mean you can get really close but like all those people working together so anyway that's an aspect of of filmmaking that you've got to work together no matter what even if the storyboards are very detailed right you you still have to work together on set to make it well in real life it looks like this right and i i was gonna i'm gonna jump on that from the top you know from the executive producer the person with money they give the money to the creative team and the creative team you know can take that and then do their work what's their work well the writer can write the writer then creates a screenplay or a script and then they hand that off to the next person they hand that off to the director and the producing team and then what does the director do the director creates vision and you know like um you know just the meat you know builds it up into something that's 3d instead of just 2d and abstract and in your mind and then what do they do well they hand off instructions to the people who have to execute it you know and they work like you're saying um you know uh don't want to say whatever collectively um they work collectively with the other people on set so the director then hands the storyboards and the shot lists you know or creates that with the dp and then the dp thinks about the the lighting and the image and then works with the gaffer to then set up all the lighting and rigging and things like that and then um you know sideways the art department is also getting instructions from the director and occasionally some notes from the dp so that they can execute a set and you know while maintaining that vision that the director created that came from the script that the writer created that was um, permissible because it was funded or in our case because we all high-fived each other and said let's do it yeah. you know so at well, every at every stage there's something you, that hands right. off then you have then you have editing and post-production sound design i mean if you just if you look at the recut trailers it makes it how clear you know how clear like each piece of the process is you know the recut trailer of The Shining as like a a comedy you know? <laughs> or like Mrs. Doubtfire is a horror movie yeah, like yeah. like a like yeah. a thriller right. suspense and like film. you yeah. watch them and it's like th- it actually looks really so if somebody did a whole movie like that it might be hard with a whole movie but you know like all of that is gonna change it's gonna change the vision you know uh-huh. depending on who you have so. um, um any, anything else with uh filming camera technology a lot of my que- honestly anything? a lot of my questions would probably be more artistic no more introductory like what the heck's a gaffer you know like <laughs> sure. just you know things that are whole, just like oh you said yeah. that and i know i have no idea yeah. what that is I at all we, i think we can could you explain do a whole it? episode like that yeah, it's, yeah. Those, interesting yeah it, it's it's very hard to get you know those are the questions that i can I give you a asked. couple i can give you a couple that, that we were talking about a gaffer is and we'll have a <laughs> definition there um, but the gaffer is the person who's in charge of executing the lighting vision of the okay. director of photography. The director of photography is in charge of photography. So yeah. they're in charge of the camera department. They're in charge of the lighting and grip department. Um, they're sideways from the art department. And the director is above all of these departments. Mm. Um, gaffer is probably something really cool. It's like like Richard Gaffer was a phenomenal lighter. <laughs> Lighter. Just who says that? That's got to be it. Just like Richard Gaffer. Dick Gaffer. Just like Foley. Like <laughs> Big Dick Gaffer. Like, like what did you call me? <laughs> My name's Charles. I don't know, but we're gonna keep it. <laughs> Just like Foley. And they couldn't Gaffer. call people Big Dick. Like they're the Big Dick. They're the Big Dick. Eh. They're the Gaffer. Um, 
it's probably something to do with that the gaffer that's what the gaffer does there. okay um, responsible for the lighting and they they often have grips and electrical best boy electrical mm-hmm. best boy just typically means the top you know in a department um, it's probably something really strange behind that name too um, okay I'm end gonna of sentence pull this I'm gonna pull it back to a question about being outside versus inside and the challenges of filming puppets and puppeteers uh, what changes being you know in a controlled environment versus being outside where you're lighting i would imagine having this be i gotta get going soon uh be your um <laughs> just get up and walk away halfway through the question <laughs> actually my wife is outside now so just mic go. drop um, finish the question and walk away. the question <laughs> is uh the challenges that are presented from being uh in an in a controlled space versus <clears throat> being outside when you've got lighting if you're outside for a long shoot you know you've got the sun changing th- you know you've you talked about the challenges of lighting puppets i was just interested to know what changes and and what kind of challenges uh the environment presented you know everything changes <laughs> i i'll everything. quick answer on the the lighting side of things i mean when you're outside the sun is your light and and you you have one light source typically i mean on a scale like this you can yeah. bring in huge trucks lots of you know giant hmis that 100 are, 100 case <laughs> whatever sun, sun but light. but mostly you're going to use the sun as your light and then you're going to bounce that light around using reflectors and bounce mm-hmm. boards and things like that in fact again this uh jordan post this gaffer was telling us that you know way back when early in the days of movie making the studios would have an open top and or they would open up the top and they would let the sunlight in and bounce it around with mirrors you know to create their yeah, lighting this, this was in american cinematographer they had yeah. you know that's how they would light in studios because they could i don't know what the hell did they they had electricity that's stupid well, well maybe not the light have, technology yeah, or this kind of technology yeah. yeah so they would have you know some kind of prism or something to split the light into different ways and then mirrors and just all these contraptions. I think that they actually did some similar things in the Grand Budapest Hotel in one of the hotel shots where they just open up the ceiling and then use that light. Because like John's say, saying, um, when you're outside, and especially on our scale, you know, it's a very small scale with puppets, um, the sun is your biggest asset and, and biggest enemy. challenge. Yeah. But then sometimes, yeah, it'd be like, you know, every now and then somebody just turns off a light. <laughs> yeah. Because the clouds come That's in, right. you know, yeah. and you got to like, you got to play around with that. So, a lot of people, I think a lot of indie things you see like shot outside because you don't need all the light and or you don't need lights, fixtures and electricity and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really tricky and it's really tricky to get it to look good. And those were some questions we were asking ourselves early on. How do we make this look not suddenly low budget once we are, we're outside and just look like a bunch of people running around with cameras. Yeah, yeah like like really high contrast, um, you know, like shot on a on a VHS cam or, you know, a little handy cam where there's just high contrast because it, it has a very small dynamic range. That's that's where dynamic range comes in. With a really large dynamic range, we can show from, you know, really bright to really dark. You can see a lot more fine detail. And outside, um, you know, like John's saying, you use the sun and there's a lot of challenges with it moving. But also, um, that's not about also. Do you need to leave? I do. I, I can continue answering this. Right. Okay, cool. everybody. Mm-hmm. Phil's going to leave. Yeah. Let me snap my fingers Bye, and he'll go guys. away. <laughs> All right. Oh, oh, oh my God. Right. Where did he right. leave? Oh. oh, they're dropping like flies. <sighs> that was so exhausting. Oh. Um, <laughs> Him leaving. So, I mean, one of. just exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. <laughs> I already ran in the bush when you guys were talking earlier. One of the benefits uh. to shooting, well, one of the um, ways that we've cheated and been able to shoot outside is is we've been shooting under tree cover because, you know, fantasy movies happen in forests That's true. predominantly. So we've been able to shoot a lot in trees where there's a lot of dappling of light. There's a lot of softening of light. So we don't have to deal with a lot of harsh light. Um, but like John was mentioning earlier, when the sun moves or when there's a cloud, you'll just instantly lose light in your in your shot, and you can't use that. And sometimes you have to wait, you know, ten seconds. Sometimes you have to wait a few minutes. Sometimes, you know, you thought sunset was at, um, you know, eight thirty, but because of where you are and where the trees are, it happens forty five minutes earlier. Yeah. Well, there. th- there's been there's been numerous times where we've been ready to go for the shot, basically s- almost said action, and then had to stop immediately because the sun went away. 
or the sun went under the clouds. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, okay, so now it's that it's that game, and I've, I've, I've watched you guys do this, where it's that game of, okay, do we wait? Mm-hmm. Will it come back? Or do we try to find another way of getting the shot lit? Mm-hmm. And you start going another way to get it lit, and then the sun comes back. Right. That's happened. I know that's happened at least once. You know, so it's that it's that game of well, okay, you have to keep constantly being on <laughs> right, board and trying right. to figure out what's, what you're going to do next. And, and I mean, that's just that's something you do with indie, low budget. You know, we're looking at this other article the other day talking about the <clears throat> movie Pompeii, I think, and they have this you know giant gladiator arena. And they're looking at st- uh, they had st- a still from the movie, and I was like, oh yeah, outside, whatever. And then you read about it, and it's like, no, like on a huge set like that, they don't play around with that. They don't play around with the sun. They or don't whatever. chance it. Yeah. They just put a sheet, basically, over the entire Colosseum, mm-hmm. and then they lit it up with like a hundred. 100k right or lights bounced off the ceiling and then like one or maybe a hundred like 10k and then like 100k as like the main sunlight Soft source sun, yeah. and just insane like they, cre- they they recreate. can't mess around with it yeah you know i don't know how much that day big. like that day cost two million five yeah. million dollars they can't mess around and not get the shot yeah. Um, one thing with the camera that's been really nice being outside is I don't really have to worry about the level of light. Um, when we're inside and we have our own lighting set up, a lot of times I'm doing everything I can to make sure I can have some focus um, because when you're wide open, when your aperture's um, as low as it can go, uh, you're going to get the shallow, the shallowest amount of depth in your focus, which means from you know your nose to the back in front of your nose to the back of your nose mm-hmm. is going to be in focus well that's not useful even if i put it on your eye then your nose is a little out of focus and something's going to look so, wrong the entire time yeah you look something's going to look wrong and yep. if somebody moves just a hair they're going to be out of focus so that was a big challenge inside outside it's a little bit of the opposite where it kind of starts looking a little handy cam when everything's in focus you know everything looks the same so then we got to balance it by uh increasing the shutter and lowering the iso Um, which can give you a crisper image. Um, But then also when you raise the shutter, it starts making a much more crisp and action-like motion on the screen as opposed to the kind of um, smooth, um, what's that? Uh, There's a blur, blurry, you know, blurry motion in 24 frames. Mm -hmm. Motion Um, blur. Motion blur. (laughs) Some some would say. Technical (laughs) terms, technical (laughs) terms, mind you. Science. Um, So, I mean, it's been fantastic outside because we get such a crisp image, but then outside it's the challenge of trying to make sure that we have the right amount of focus that we want so that it's not just everything's in focus, you can see everything because a lot of, you know, a lot of what uh, camera work is is making sure that the focus is in the right place, Not, not the technical focus of the lens, but the focus of what you're looking at. So, you know, the main person who's supposed to be um, you're supposed to pay attention to is the one that you naturally want to draw your light, your eyes to, whether it's through lighting um, or uh, positioning and blocking or, you know, camera and uh, lensing. I think a lot of people stumbled onto cinematic shooting because before when you were in a dark room, you just couldn't shoot. You, you take like a VHS camera or a low quality camera in and it just looked terrible. It was super dark or really grainy and just blah. And the DSLRs with um, better, you know, light. Um, yeah, better low light functionality. Better low light and, and higher ISOs allowed you to crank up the ISO and still get a pretty decent image. And then you had this lens, but you had to have the lens wide open. Mm-hmm. So now suddenly people who are just kind of goofing around are finding that they have this really shallow depth of mm-hmm. field. But then when you look at that, it's really pleasing to the eye because it's what we're used to with movies. It's mm-hmm. the, right in the cinema. You're, you're focusing on just the person that you want to see and then the rest of the background is whatever. So yeah, that's <clears throat> that's the thing. But then, like you said, outside, there's still that struggle. Now you have to think about it. You have to be purposeful. You can't just accidentally stumble onto it with a DSLR, you know, in a low lit room and you, you know, open everything up. You're right. outside. And you, if you close everything down, you get that cheaper feeling, that cheaper look. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, what you're d- d- discussing too, um, I think really hit the world stage with the, the Canon 5D Mark II 
which is the first camera that, um, well, not the first camera that we had, but the first camera that we had that we thought, whoa, we're movie makers. And then, you know, you realize you're not, but um, that, that technology and that look. I'm not a movie maker? That, I'm, well, that technology and that look is, oh. is very sexy. It's very cinematic and, you know, it's a, it's a huge step in the, um, you know, in the direction towards uh, professional filmmaking because you have an image that resembles what you see in a film and it's one of those things where like I remember I remember um, an episode of house because I remember there was that there was that period of time there for a little while where these cameras were becoming more prevalent mm-hmm. and studios were like oh that's not going to be the this same quality right yeah that one right there the one that's focusing on John and yeah. might be still recording um, I just hit it oh beautiful it then it is recording but like I remember like the studios being like oh it's never going to take over you know because people are like these could actually mm-hmm. make Hollywood movies cheaper and the studio's like no it's never going to do it and house did an entire episode right using basically not commercial grade but like personal grade dslr cameras right. and went look yeah we had to build a special rig in order to put our lens on it but mm-hmm. it still was like it's un- it's a camera you could go out and buy right it's a two grand bot oh oh hello <laughs> welcome to this part of <laughs> oh i don't know what happened there <laughs> it's uh it's a swaddle swaddle a little awkward. little person i think that's a pc term um it's it's a two thousand dollar three thousand dollar body, where usually it would be fifty thousand or sixty thousand or a hundred thousand, which, um, like you're saying with House, they they shot a whole episode or two. Uh, Twenty four did maybe a season or several episodes with tons of them because they're like, hey, let's buy ten and put them wherever and throw them around because they're easily disposable. They're yeah. cheaper than the if, if it hundred thousand dollar right. camera. Exactly, exactly. And I guess the point that I was trying to make was that you watch that episode of House and I go, yeah, you that know. it looks just like every other episode. Right. It looks like, like I think I know what I'm looking for, so sure. it might be a little more noticeable. But the average person's going to watch it going, so say change their camera, yeah. not realizing that camera is the quality of camera you can have in your hand nowadays for not that right. much money. Well, and and I mean what they what they shot with and and how they did it is going to look better than what I shot with it and what I did with it mm-hmm. um because there's there's skill there's a lot of skill yeah, you know the with the same device the, it's uh, not so a lot of people always say you know um a camera is just a tool and I choose the right camera for the job well i mean that works when you have really big budgets and you know can just afford whatever the hell you want mm-hmm. um which is not a lot of a lot of indie startup small companies like that it's it's whatever you can invest in which might be the 5d might be the 70 might be the 60d or something from nikon apparently they make cameras um but you know we we always joke and it you know it's a tool but it's a primary tool and so um you know while people just say it's just a tool we think you know, its importance is greater than that in that you, you know, you learn on something. And what we want to do with a $2,000 camera is get a $100,000 image, mm-hmm. um, which is certainly achievable, which House showed us 24. And, you know, there's there's probably films that um, films that shot all on 5D Mark IIs that uh, I'm not even aware of that look fantastic, look like regular movies. But that's because there's a lot of skill in there and you know, whatever camera you have in your hand is the best camera at that moment. And, and, and if you're talking about, you know, indie filmmaking, it's not, it doesn't quite apply, you know, the just a tool idea, because like you said, like, what can you afford? And you can afford that once. And that's what you have. And that's what you're going to shoot on. Right. You the, know, the, the, the troll blog, extra point for me. Um, actually, uh, I mean, I have a Canon T2i. That's Wait, are we all, talking about the troll blog The troll again? blog. Uh, oh. Oh, but see, yes, the troll blog is exactly what we were talking about. The troll blog, troll blog, troll blog. Um, is the episode. Troll blog, 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 troll blog. And that's the last time I ever slept with her. The troll blog? No, anyways. That was awkward. No, so like the troll blog, I have a Canon T2i that I bought four years ago five years ago right and it just fine like i mean it's not the greatest camera well aware yeah. H- any of these cameras right now are a better quality camera than that camera is but i use it to the best that i can because right. i can't afford to spend three grand on a new camera body to shoot a web and you series. created some awesome awesome comedy and it comes out and it's like you yeah. know what it's secondary. I know. I still know enough to get by with yeah. what I'm doing, and I use it to the best of my ability. But I'm well aware it can look and better. No one's watching that on a 4K TV, so it can be you know sexy to their eyes. Right. Exactly. It's about the content, and and I think that's that's important to remember. You know, it's always about the content. There's a lot of people who have Reds 
who shoot really shitty content. Yeah. You know, movies and pieces. Some of the film festival pieces were red. Maybe we'll cut this out. Um, some of the some of them were shot in red, and they were just not good. Yeah. Um, I've worked on a couple shows that were shot on red. You know, like projects. The, the camera, the camera doesn't make the movie. You know, the the people do. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a good place, I guess. Vimeo's kind of become the the space for. Uh, you know, independent filmmakers who have want to shoot, you know, be- like display beautiful mm-hmm. imagery and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so what I was going to say is the, like the T2I and some of these like lower level 60D, whatever, whatever you want to say, cameras, not only is it like, oh, that's good enough. Like in a lot of, t- a lot of cases, it's actually really nice. Mm-hmm. Like right. from what some people now, maybe the trade off is what it takes to get that image is more difficult or maybe clunky and so like on a professional set it's not going to work because you're fiddling around and the director's like are we ready yet whatever but if you're just a solo independent you know indie guy i have hit my microphone a lot (laughs) if you're just like an indie guy you know you, you take your camera out and you've got a lot of time you know and you're shooting like a beautiful landscape or something if you spend the time a lot of times some of those cameras can get amazing images i've done some i've done some really great photography with my camera that i never thought i would ever that i i still that i still don't think i took (laughs) but i mean it's like you look at it yeah those can't those demon jazz we'll explain (laughs) that in a future episode (laughs) when apparently i just go crazy (laughs) uh no like uh uh i've taken some photos on that my t2i and it's you know i I, it can be they can be compared because they have been compared to high-end very nice photography and I'm like, I didn't, I was the light that was there and I didn't really spend a whole lot of time doing it. Now, if I had spent a lot more of the time, I actually, you know, perfected it and got exactly the right, like, I'm sure it probably would have looked 10 times better, but it still came out looking great. And again, that's a camera that I bought myself for a grand at the time with two lenses and the body and, you know, yeah, entry level. You're like, whatever. Whatever. I just, just I could have spent more time, but I'm that good. I'm just that good to go snap. And uh, I'm done. Philip Philip Bloom is a, is a great uh, British photographer, cinematographer who you can look at too. Um, where he gets he gets he, a lot he, of he's cameras. also he's also a great cinematographer. Yeah. Wait, didn't I say that? Oh, it's just you know not <laughs> to the qualifier British. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> he's not just a great, great British guy. He's a, he's a pretty good camera. He's guy. a great he's a great photographer and cinematographer, and he he gets uh, a lot of review um, devices. So he gets to review all the cameras that come out, and um, his GoPro stuff is better than you know some of my work. I just say all of my work. <laughs> um, his GoPro stuff is just phenomenal, and you know the little, little cameras that he gets, the little cheap cameras that he gets <laughs> to test out are phenomenal mm-hmm. because he's good. He's got good lenses and stuff like that, but but he's good. You know, he has an eye for the shot, and you make it work. You make whatever technology you have available work. Well, and one part of that, you know, like GoPro, how do you, how would the GoPro stuff be better than some of our stuff? Well, I think one element to that is. Uh, Because the GoPro, a lot of it's automatic. Like, you Mm -hmm. can't really control much with it. So a lot of it's going to be movement, Mm -hmm. you know. And so that gets to another aspect of, like, shooting the movie and shooting things. Like, um, you know, how have you used... Now I get to ask the questions because I'm left. Um, Jeff can ask questions as well, I guess. Um, No, I'm here just to talk. (laughs) I don't ask questions. Um, (laughs) By the end of this, yeah, I'll, you know, we'll be down to just Ryan asking himself <laughs> questions. Um, Which six is where hour we started. Episode. So what have oh. we, d- you know, what solutions have we, you know, we come up with or, you know, you come up with that, you know, how do how do we achieve those cinematic things? Like you could just talk about the, the yeah. pieces of it. Like we've talked about lenses and cameras and stuff, but and lighting. Right. Um, but then movement is another yeah, so, so motivated movement is very important, and unmotivated uh, movement can be distracting. Um, but something, I mean, you see it in Michael Bay films, but you'll see it in a lot of different films since Spielberg. Um, he was kind of the, the first director to really move the camera in an intentional way. Um, movement has kind of become part of the cinematic experience that we um, that we rely on in order to accept that what we're seeing is is a is a cinematic story. Um, and a lot of that 
I think is more because there's there's a production value that we don't realize we're seeing, but subconsciously we associate that with a film. You know, following somebody with a camera, moving around them, a slight bobble to understand that we're seeing from somebody's perspective or something like that, um, are things that we've we've come to expect. And so when you don't see them, you ask yourself why? Why you know why is this static? Why is everything static? Why is nothing moving? Um, good directors, um, I think. Um, uh, Fight Club. What's his name? Um, David Fincher. David Fincher. Um, he has a lot of static stuff, um, and you, I, I've never asked why. Why are we not moving? You know, why am I when I see from that perspective? Why am I not looking around? Or why is this not a crazy big move and things like that? On the flip side, you have Michael Bay who can't stop moving. Um, there's a lot of critiques there that um, it's it's you know it's self serving. It's for itself. It doesn't forward the story. It's just kind of. Um, you know, it's like rock candy. What what the heck is that for? Mm-hmm. Um, so so that movement is unnecessary. But even that is 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 seen as part of the cinematic kind of imagery and style. And so with this with the uh, P- the Princess Knight, we wanted to make sure that um, we paid attention to that. That we uh, you know accepted that and brought it in without doing too much. And so a lot of what we shot in the castle, we shot on a slider uh, to to give a little bit of movement, a little bit more life, um, because there's there's only so much that the puppeteers can do and they do a fantastic job of giving them life but in my opinion kind of moving around in the scene with them gives them more energy and more life um and we we always kind of try to approach it um so that we're not doing movement for movement's sake that we're we're actually doing something cinematically that that forwards the story um, but there, there is a lot more movement than than you'll see in, um, you know, other films, and I think it's I think it's important with, you know, with the puppets, like I mentioned earlier, um, but it also I think it also helps to just hide kind of the, um, you know, some of the indie indie nature of it. I mean, that's that's what you'll see a lot of handy cam and things like that um, in indie films, and it it's you know it's a little bit of a trick. I accept that. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I think that, so I think what you're thinking about is, you know, we went to this um, directing motion conference with Vincent LaForge and he talked a lot about motivated movement. And obviously that's the ideal way to do it. Move when there's a reason to move. Right. But, um, but it happens a lot. I mean, you just watch mm-hmm. a dialogue scene and it's very, I mean, the key is subtlety. And I think that's where Michael Bay, that's where he gets his critique because he's not subtle. Right. Michael Bay is totally subtle. What are you talking about? <laughs> Giant explosions and robots are subtle. And well, I you mean, see when he's not subtle. He's ta- he, like it's he's, it's the three the low three sixty. Yeah. He'll do yes. so many. He'll spin around somebody opposite where, where yeah. they're going to you know to add even more spin. Want yeah, more she, spin. Shia LaBeouf stepped out of the the museum. Or Shia LaBeouf, you know, it's either one of those guys. Shia Lebo. That's his brothers. <laughs> I think it's French, right? Shia Lebo. Shia Lebo. <laughs> well, with that moment, I think that's a good roundabout back to the beginning. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. Did Almost you finish your thought? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Movement happens. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, still here. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Oh my gosh, I hear like your throat like bobbling. Is this, am I still? Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry for taking so long. Okay, all right. Scoot out of here. I can, I, I can need some help with the chair. I'm just gonna, I'll just leave the chair. I don't know.